Jonathan and me, welcome to the programme. Now, first tonight, the father of the murdered Essex teenager, Dinah McNichol, has spoken about plans to build a memorial to his daughter and fellow victim Vicky Hamilton in the town where their bodies were buried. Their remains were found in Margate in the garden of the former home of their killer, Peter Tobin. Today, 19 years after she first went missing, Ian McNichols spoken of his joy at creating a lasting memorial to preserve his daughter's memory. Serena Sandu reports. For 16 years, Ian McNichol waited for news on his 18-year-old daughter, Dinah. The teenager from Tillingham in Essex disappeared in the summer of 1991 after visiting this music festival in Hampshire. It wasn't until 2007 that police excavated the gardens of Number 50, Irvine Drive in Margate. It was here that police found the remains of Vicky Hamilton and Dinah McNichol. It's a place that will forever haunt Ian. The council has refused to knock the house down, but he's now working with him and Vicky's family to plan a memorial in the town, a lasting tribute to their loved ones. Anyway, it's all worked out for the best as a compromise. I'm quite happy with the com com compromise. So is Michael. And that's it finished, done, dusted, the whole thing. Dinah and Vicky were among the victims of Peter Tobin. Last December, he was convicted of killing Dinah while already serving a life sentence for the murder of a Polish woman, Angelika Kluck. Ian says he was told by friends to give up his fight to have the house destroyed due to the impact on his health. The council says locals want the house relet so life there can get back to normal. Michael and Christy and his wife had a right go at me and said... Do you want to live six months or the rest of your life? Because you're actually killing yourself by being spiteful against this council and there's no way you can win. And I said, yeah, I know. He said, give it up now, the whole thing. Just drop the whole thing. It's thought a memorial bench and tree will be placed somewhere in the town to commemorate two young women who fell victim to a brutal serial killer. I'm happy with the conclusion, uh, but uh, I'm not happy about the time. It just took too long. For now, Ian McNichol is hoping that a permanent memorial will allow him and the rest of Dinah's family some peace at last. But while it provides some comfort... Ian is also left questioning why it took so long. Serena Sandu, Anglia News. Well, moving on now, in 24 years after he was jailed for refusing a smoker a ride in his taxi, a cabbie from Basildon is vowing to clear his name. 67-year-old Richard Carlos, who suffers from acute bronchitis, was behind bars for a week after he turned down a passenger from Heathrow who insisted on lighting up. But now, after changes in the smoking laws, the grandfather of two is hoping finally to have his case heard in the Court of Appeal. Liz Wickham has this report. Richard Carlos survived TB as a child but was left with severe asthma. Determined to be independent, he did the knowledge, freezing on a little motorbike and got his license as a black cabbie. But 24 years ago, he refused to pick up a smoker at Heathrow Airport, saying it would aggravate his asthma. And I said to him, I personally can't manage to be a passive smoker, Governor, but I'll fix you up in the cab yard who's a mate of mine who's smoking a cigar. He'll take you, right? And this traffic warden come up and he said to me, he's going to smoke in your cab, uh, uh, or, uh, or else I'll call the police. You've got to do it or else. He refused to pay the £120 fine and spent seven days in Pentonville Prison. I can't tell you how many people said to me, we want to pay you Summit Crown Court fines and everything. And I said, no. I said, I can't have that. It's got to go how it's got to go. I can't have no one paying a fine because I'll be still admitting I'm guilty and getting someone else to pay the fine. And I won't have it because I'm not guilty. He lost his first wife, his home and his beloved cabbie's badge. My badge was the only real thing that I ever achieved, apart from being oh, very ordinary and, and obstinate. My left leg is twice the size of my right leg, right? If I could kick him with it for what they've done to me, I would. You know, I'm a peaceful man, but I can't take what they've done to me 
My whole soul's revolting against the injustice of it. Before he dies, Richard Carlos wants one thing. One day here at the High Court, where he hopes the British establishment will apologise for imprisoning him simply for trying to protect his fragile health from passive smoking. People stabbed me in the back, but I couldn't back down. It's a principle. Liz Wickham in Basildon for Anglia tonight. With the general election campaign now well underway, MPs are finishing last-minute business at Westminster before Parliament is officially dissolved. Today was the final Prime Minister's question time. Gordon Brown and David Cameron clashed in the Commons over Labour's proposed 1% increase in national insurance. After today, MPs who are standing again will be heading back to their constituencies to begin campaigning. Now then, we've had the green vote and the pink one as well for that matter, but could this be the election of the grey vote? In more than half of all constituencies, the majority of voters at this election will be over 55. And in our region, the grey vote is stronger than most. Yes, the North Norfolk constituency is among the top ten for the number of older voters. Nearly a fifth of households are home to a single pensioner there. That number is also high in Suffolk Coastal, where the figure is 18%. But the highest proportion of single pensioner households in the whole country is in Clapton, where it's nearly a quarter of all homes. Our reporter Martin Stew has taken a trip to the Essex coast to gauge the mood of the grey vote. The election fun fair is off and running. Time to expect political ups, downs and plenty of spin. But for the fresh-faced political candidates, it's not the voters of tomorrow who are the concern today. In fact, it's the so-called grey vote. The over 55s have seen and heard it all before. Now, more than ever, the power is in their hands. Come the 6th of May, 69% of all people who vote here in Clacton are likely to be 55 or over. The message, therefore, to politicians is clear. Ignore the grey voter at your peril. Yet many on the high street think that's exactly what's happening. There's nothing for pensioners. There's plenty for children, which there should be. Hospitals. There should be, because we all, all need the health service, but for us, what is being done? They've all got the same attitude. We, we're just fed up with a whole lot, and just let us die. That's the best thing to get out of it. The feeling is rife right throughout the great vote, definitely. With over 55s more likely to turn out and vote, research by De Montford University has found over half of all constituencies are likely to have a grey majority of voters. If politicians want power, you can bet they hold the key to an overall majority. Uh, the Lib Dem are 200 to 1. And for no majority, it's 6 to 4. And after the expenses scandal, it's not just the result which hangs in the balance, it's the very reputation of Parliament. Oh dear, don't, don't <laughs> talk about respect. I mean, it all starts at the top, doesn't it? If they were to show respect for people, then it, it carries through, doesn't it? See, I told you not to get me started. <laughs> Politicians, you have been warned. To win this lot over will be hard work. Martin Stew, Anglia News, Clacton. Oh, someone's doing more work than someone else in that little picture there. I think right now it's 10 minutes.